This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. This is why the Nkunguma Pride is such a firm favourite. It's Kinky Tail. He just looks ready for a fight. This is still her territory. Ooh. The Evoker boys are here to stay. Ooh. How insane was that? A very, very good afternoon and most of all, welcome to the episode 47 of Safari Lives. This is Sydney Pumurani Mikosi and I am coming to you live from the tent this afternoon with very interesting stories. My focus this afternoon, it is going to be the untold stories of the Dem Cam. This afternoon hopefully is going to be an amazing this afternoon as we are going to reveal those activities which are taking place at night by the surrounding of our dam camp. So you can see at the moment I'm just moving here in between the skulls, different skulls at the moment and I have picked up something very very interesting at the moment but before I go on on this I want us to go over to Steve who is by the Masai Mara this afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this Monday afternoon in the Mara Triangle in Kenya. My name is Steve, and well, what a fantastic afternoon it is for episode 47 of Safari Lives. You probably hear a few cars around the vehicle at, at the moment right now. We are at the Awino Pride clan from this morning, or kill from yesterday afternoon. I'm joined by James on camera, and obviously this is the highlighted teams of the Mara this afternoon. And what a week of hunting it's been. I mean, I've had cheetah running around doing their thing. We've had the Celtic pride on the move, uh, cubs in training, and well, hasn't been that successful from a hunting point of view. But David, last night with these, what you can see, three members there, there's a fourth one. And uh, when you opened the shot, that was the fifth member hiding in the tree. So it's not often you get to see lions up in trees, but the flies out here, everybody, are unbelievable. Uh, the buffalo carcass is just on the side of us here, so if you're a little bit sensitive to that, we'll show you shortly. But let's go to the lioness in the tree who is trying to avoid the flies. And so we're going to be spending time with the Winos today because there's going to be some action. James and I did have two members earlier on in the week who didn't get them doing too much, but I've been really trying very hard to find these guys. And well, David, as at the last minute last night, found the pride and a very poor little buffalo. And if you weren't a part of that, well, we're gonna to have to catch you up on it at some stage because it was a very, very intense sighting. But for now, in the 29 degrees in the Mara, let's head you back down to Juma. Jamie would like to say good afternoon. Lots and lots of last minute finds yesterday evening. Thank goodness because it saved our TV show. A very good afternoon, my name is Jamie and this afternoon making his triumphant return to Safari Live is BK. And we're all of course thrilled to have him back on the back of our vehicles with us. And welcome to this, the 47th, how time rolls on, episode of a Safari Lives. Of course, we spent yesterday evening with the Juma clan, but I'm going to save that conversation for when we get to a little bit later in the evening. And the hyenas are more likely to be out and about. The guys found a new hyena den this morning. So we're going to be paying them a visit a little bit later and we'll chat a bit about what happened with them last night because I have some fun stories to tell you. But first, on the theme of this afternoon's Safari Live, the secrets of the Juma Dam Cam. Well, here's my little secret, which actually isn't really a secret. My history or my sort of background with Wild Earth actually started, although I didn't realize it at the time, long before I arrived at Wild Earth to do my interview four years ago. 
It actually started when I was very young and very privileged and immensely ill-advised and was doing a law degree in the UK for three years. And to satisfy the call of the wild, what I used to do was sit and listen to the live dam cam on Africa. I used to sit with headphones on and while I studied, I'd listen to the sounds of the night. So that's actually where my background <laughs> with Wild Earth started. I had no idea at the time that this is what I'd end up doing. But I vividly remember, because I used to turn the volume right up to listen to the sound of the frogs and the crickets. I vividly remember <laughs> a barn owl screeching in my ear one night and I got such a fright, slammed my laptop closed and jumped on my bed in the England. Anyway, speaking of the secrets of the dam camp, off you pop across to Sydney so that he can reveal some of the secrets we've seen. It looks like quite a lot of uh, nocturnals, they are enjoying themselves just by the dam cam at night. When they are doing their hunting at night, some of them, they are hanging around there in search of something to eat. And this afternoon, we are going to share quite a lot of different species who are interacting by this uh, dam cam. So I just want to quickly show you something very interesting which has been happening there when one of these beautiful creatures, the reptiles, was walking around there one of the good days. So look at that, look at that movement of that very beautiful puff adder. If you look at that puff adder very nicely, uh, you will see that this puff adder is looking very short and the tail on this uh, puff adder is so very much short and that is telling me that this puff adder must be a female as the males they have got normally the long tails and these tails they are also one of their techniques when they are looking for something to eat these kind of beautiful snakes they do use different techniques and one of them is just waving their tails just to fool their prey so that they can be able to get something to eat. So let's just quickly look at how this puff adder is moving at the moment. So look at that kind of a movement, uh, that kind of a motion, we call it a rectilinear movement. It is kind of a straight movement, more like a caterpillar. And if you check on this uh, puff adder, when he was moving, he was looking very much slow and having quite a lot of markings here on the bodies, which looks more like the chevron-like. And it's like he's having quite a lot of legs here on the edges. It's just that now that puff adder just uh, went right through those kind of bushes. But when it's in these bushes, you can still see the movement there. And the tongue is also doing uh, what is uh, called the orientation and navigation. Look at that. And something interesting about this tongue on this puff adder is that when we talk again about the different strategies the puff adders are using to catch, the, the, to catch their meal, the tongue is used in order to do something which is called the uh, longinal luring. So here is whereby they use this tongue in order to again fool their prey to come closer so that they can catch. In other words, these two different techniques, they are not termed the same way. When using the tail is called the cardinal luring. So let's just see where this uh, puff art is going. Look at that. This is beautiful. So this snake is depending on that tongue in order to investigate who is coming and how big is that just from uh, putting the tongue in and out this snake can be able to detect uh, how big is the animal coming whether it's the size of the prey or is the size of a big animal which can harm them and then that is when they can be able to hide for danger to pass or else they can prepare themselves just to strike this is one of the fastest striking snakes here in Africa. And all this is happening captured by the dam cam. Look at how beautiful this is. Marlin, thank you very, very much for such a lovely comment. 
I will never get enough when it comes to the puff adders because they are so very much relaxed and they are dangerous, yes, but most of the times they are relaxed. And something very interesting about these puff adders is that when they are doing their hunting habits, they are very much territorial and they do have the kind of hot spots. They've got areas they prefer. Sometimes they can even go and spend hours and days, sometimes up to weeks, waiting for a prey to come. Isn't that amazing? So it means here by the dam cam, maybe that is where this one we are seeing now is using as one of his hotspot for foraging purposes. So now let's cross over to Rusty, who is now having one of those that can easily get predated by this kind of snakes. Birds, they're also part of their dietary requirements. Well, we have a very interesting stalk here. It's a marabou stalk, and I was actually talking about it yesterday, so I think this might be a sign. I think it's good luck that we have found one. So close to camp, since we are talking about the dam camp, we are not, we are, I can actually see the dam camp from here at the Volotea Dam, so that I think is coincidence. I think not, but we are in the area where Talumba was last seen, also her tracks were last seen. So that is where we are heading now this afternoon to try follow up if we can see if her tracks are at least coming down to the dam to drink and if they're moving out in the area. So that Marabou stalk, I think for us is definitely a sign. Now it's not often you get them in the area. Yeah. Well, while we keep a close eye on what this marabou gets up to, let's go over to a past clip of Tlumba, Tandi and Tangana. It seems that the family get-togethers are just as intense in the leopard world as they can be in our human lives. With tensions high between Talamba and Tandi, Tungana stepped in just in time to defuse the situation. The Princess Talamba was showing all kinds of teenage tendencies, pitting one parent against the other before moving off into the thickets. Unfazed by his daughter's bad behaviour, Tungana settled in to listen to Tandi's woes. Not shy to put forward his opinion in a matter or two. With that, the family continued arguing long into the evening, disturbing the peace of an otherwise quiet night. Well, it was an interesting interaction between the three of them. It is not often that is the case where you see three leopards interacting with each other, especially or oh, that is a, like a family reunion if you want to look at it that way. Tandi, Talamba, and Tungana. Tungana is actually Talamba's father, and it is, it's not often the case, but with such, with these territories being within each other's, it is sometimes a case where they do overlap and end up meeting in one spot. So, while we are talking about family reunions, let's go over to Steve, who's got an update. Thanks, Rusty. Well, I wonder if the dam cam has ever caught anything like this. The lioness in a tree. She went up there quite all right earlier. She's had her head hidden in the branches, and actually, it's quite easy to tell in her face. There's far few flies than there were on the other lines that are on the ground. And she's turned around, I think she's deciding she wants to come down now, but this is always the funniest part. She's got an enormously full belly. 
and I think she wants to come and either have a drink or come and play with the family. Her black backed jackal moved past earlier and as she moved it looked up and went probably thought I've never seen a lion in a tree before what's this world coming to and it bolted off. James and I are both very surprised at the lack of scavengers around here we haven't seen a single vulture and there's been three black backed jackal that haven't ventured anywhere near. Here we go now everybody prepare yourself on social media to give this a score out of 10 if you will. <laughs> I always like to judge the landings of our animals. Even James Hendry descending a tree requires a score out of 10. So I think she's going to come down, but she's really considering it. Okay, so Emma reckons the setup so far is a five. It's a pretty decent tree that she's in. She's a good four and a half meters, five meters off the ground, which is for most of you out there. Um, you'd probably think twice about launching yourself out. Uh, a lion, you know, it's a cat. We think, okay, they've got the right sort of strategy. They've got, they've got the, the the claws. Here we go. Are you ready to throw your score out of ten onto Twitter, please, everybody, or throw it in on the YouTube chat stream? Young lioness, a score out of ten. <laughs> this is the, always the point. Have you ever? try to climb over a fence or you're in a tree and there's that moment when you hesitate. <laughs> Linda says if James can do it anyone can. <laughs> you know that moment when you're in the tree or on a fence and you're just trying to go and you hesitate. The worst thing you can do is hesitate because then the blood starts pooling in your legs. Three. Whoa. Oh, that was actually well done. That was very well done. Well done girl. I'm gonna give you a seven and a half there. That was actually not bad at all. I thought she was gonna collapse into a heap. Uh, but now she's gonna come and join the rest of the pride. Oh, no, she's not. That required lots of energy. Deborah gives her a 12. Well, Deborah, that was probably the best descent I've ever seen from a lioness in a tree. I must tell you, I've probably only seen about five in my life, and one was an evoca male climbing down a tree. Or was a Birmingham boy, actually, climbing down a tree. He didn't do very well at all. They don't look very elegant. Okay, so this lioness has now decided to pull her buffalo around so as to provide herself with a little bit of shade a little bit of shade from the sunshine but jamie down in south africa is with the world famous hippo couple let's go and see how they're doing Not only the world of famous scuba Steve, but of course his ever constant companion, or relatively constant companion, Snorkel Sarah. Now, while we know that some people get a little bit excited about seeing the leopards on safari lives, and others, of course, look forward to look forward to moments like the one that Steve just experienced. We all know really who the true stars of the Safari Live shows actually are. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind that that title is held by Scuba Steve and Snorkel Sarah, the world's most interesting pair, and of course full of exciting interactions with each other. And what people really look forward to each and every single week is the update as to what Scuba Steve and Snorkel Sarah get up to during the week and I of course would hate to disappoint you. There are some who have suggested that Scuba Steve and Snorkel Sarah deserve an award for being the most boring couple of the year. There are some who say that they could be mistaken for rocks. I'm the person saying it. Far from controversial and certainly unlikely to become tabloid fodder, the most I can concede is that their pairing has lasted longer than a fair number of celebrity marriages. Increasingly under pressure from dropping water levels and his unwarranted fame, we can only hope that Scuba Steve doesn't decide to follow a more rock and roll lifestyle. The will they won't they of our time 
here at Safari Live. So there you go. That is what Scuba Steve and Snorkel Sarah have been up to. I am, of course, being deeply ironic. Oh, we're going to, they're actually going to come up out of the water or at least show a little bit more of themselves than they usually do. I am, of course, being deeply sarcastic in what I spoke about with Snorkel Steve and Snorkel Scuba Sarah. No, that's the wrong way around. Well, whichever way around it's meant to be. I'm so sorry, Scuba Steve. Because, of course, while they certainly don't do the same things like climbing trees or hunting poor poor buffalo, the hippo, of course, are just doing what hippo do. And they are, in fact, a symbol of the challenges that we're going to face over the next few months. I say we, the animals are going to face over the next few months. I spoke about Scuba Steve's rock and roll lifestyle. He's even giving us the odd roll. Although I'm not sure much in the way of rock. So there we go. There's the rock impression. But of course, they're actually facing a really, really tough time given the current water levels. It is looking scarily dry. Ian would like to know how old Scuba Steve is. To tell you the truth, Ian, Scuba's actually quite private in terms of his personal information. And he hasn't released his official birth date. We, in fact, don't know who his parents were. And his Wikipedia article is looking extraordinarily thin. And IMDB is not doing any better when it comes to exactly how old Scuba Steve is. Life expectancy of a hippo, obviously talking utter nonsense, is around about 40 years old. He is probably around about, I would say he's probably older than 10, because at that point he's really reaching maturity. But beyond that, I could not tell you. He's one of those ageless, ageless celebrities. He could be 10, he could be 35. No one really knows. He takes extraordinarily good care of his skin. So he's looking in prime conditions. All hippo take very good care of their skin, as it happens. They, of course, secrete that special substance that helps to protect them against sunburn. The great, the great ager. So who knows exactly? Right, from the occupants of this massive waterhole to the occupants of another, let's go across to Sydney so that he can tell you a slithery story. The untold stories of the dam came, they don't end here. We still have got a long way to go this afternoon as amazing things has been happening there. And now I am going to carry on and show you more other things which has been happening there while I was sleeping. All this is happening captured by the dam cam. I've got a lovely question from one of the viewers and this is a very much important question because maybe to those of you who are our new viewers, uh, the dam cam is the first time you are hearing something like that. A dam cam, it is a camera which is fixed by one of the pens and this camera is the one which is responsible to capture every action which is taking place while we're not there. It's not only concentrating around the pen at night, also during the day it is capturing all the actions that are taking place there. Live actions are captured by this dam cam. Reason why we have got better pictures on this kind of a beautiful camera is that it is well equipped with a well sophisticated infrared so it can be able to easily detect an animal from a distance. So this is what is giving us all this beautiful sighting of this afternoon and thank you very much to the dam cam. Now I want to show you something very much interesting which also took place there. You can see the puff arrow is now moving there and we have got uh, some of the birds are starting to introduce themselves right on the presence of this puff arrow. I'm just going to stop a little bit so that we can have a little bit of a discussion there. This is a very interesting uh, interaction. If you can check now, the puff arrow is trying to maneuver the way in between the birds. And these kind of animals, the birds, they do consist something which is called a mobbing behavior. Every time they pick up something like a snake, whether it's during the day or late afternoon, you are going to hear them vocalizing, calling each other, different species trying to help each other in order to come and observe and try to attack the predators such as the snakes. But here, if you can check, not much is happening. 
And there is even one of the big bears there with a the black head. That is the heron. Heron, I'm going to tell you a very interesting story. And this story took place while I was still very young. This is to do with that heron. And again, it's something that is going to make you get surprised because the herons, I used to sleep inside the mud house and it was a hut. And there used to be a lot of uh, house sporos. You know those house sporos, the birds who normally comes and dig and drill and stay inside the roof by the outside. So one day I was seated outside and while I was sitting there, I saw this heron, he just landed on top of the roof and grabbed a very big snake from one of the nest of this sporo. So the herons, they do predate these kind of reptiles. This puff adder, let's just see what is going to happen there. You will see, he will be, he is going to manage to pass in between those birds. This heron maybe is frightened about the size of the puff adder which is passing now. If not, uh, it means uh, the heron is full because they can be able to enjoy uh, this kind of reptile as part of their delicacy. Look, everybody is watching at the moment. Yes, uh, that is quite a very lovely question. The question is to do with the uh, type of venom and the dangerous status of the venom uh, provided or produced by these puff adders. Uh, the puff adders, they have got what is called a cytotoxic venom. They are not poisonous. I know a lot of people, they think snakes are poisonous. They are venomous, which means they, you have to be injected in order to get affected. It's not something which has got something to do with food intake which is a poison so here i am going to answer your question broadly the puff adders they form part of those snakes who's got what is called a cytotoxic venom the cytotoxic venom affect your tissue skin and i know somebody uh, this is real i know somebody who got beaten by the puff adder and the fingers are permanently permanently stuck like this all the tissues are dead and my friend he is now walking with his fingers like this bent like this he cannot get the fingers straight anymore i think he was too late to consult fortunately they did not amputate him because sometimes if you take much time uh, with, a, with a bite it can affect a large part of your body so the venom this snake carries can be very much detrimental so it will only affect your tissue skin uh, the other types of venoms by the other snakes yes we have got neurotoxic venom which affect your nervous coordination and we have got this the uh, hemotoxic venom this is the venom which affect your blood so at least the puff arrow has got the one which is dangerous but i think compared to the hemotoxic it's much better so but the type of venom it has got against their prey it works very fast and it can be able to kill the prey very quickly so let's just see what is going to happen with this puff adder when it's trying to pass in between those birds at the moment the birds you can see they're not what look the puff adder is showing us something now he's swimming and he's swimming very quickly and that is quite a very nice shot you can see they can be able to swim uh, they don't only go here on the ground very slowly in water look at that speed that is too fast <laughs> you can see they can be able to go very fast. I'm not surprised why the puff adders can strike very fast because I can see they do have a lot of strength. How he's running, he's swimming there in that pen is showing that he does indeed have quite a lot of strength. Maybe he just wants to get to the other side where he's going to target his prey, but still around the dam cam. So everyone is surprised there. All the birds are very surprised. But maybe the birds, they know him. Maybe he has been there for quite a long time. Maybe we are just surprised because we are seeing these for the first time. But maybe the puff adder and the birds, they know each other because they are depending by the very same pan. So now, while we are still waiting to see more other interesting and lovely actions taking place by the dam cam, let's cross over to one of my friends. Exodus, well, can you all imagine having a little quiet swim in a pool or in a river and this thing bumps your arm and it turns out to be a puff adder? I don't quite know how I'd respond to that. But um, anyway, we are still with the Aweena Pride. And uh, if you missed it last night, David managed to capture the Aweena Pride attacking this buffalo. 
and they were doing an okay job of it. They managed to sort of either break the back legs or sever the tendons. I'm not 100% sure. Um, and then a big male lion of the Aldonia Pyak Coalition arrived and he helped sort out the buffalo and eventually pull it to the ground. But the young male, he's got a bit of a limp. He's walking away over now. There he goes. He's got a bit of a limp. He's looking much bigger than he did when I left here in November, December. He's grown so much, but the male lion is behind us somewhere. We can't see him anymore, but the entire time we've been here, this entire pride has been very wary of him. Every time he's moved, every time they've moved, they've been staring at him, and especially this young male. And David tells me he's been watching as they were feeding the adult lioness, I think it was Butternut, kept being in the way of uh, the young male and the big male because he was constantly trying to give him a hard time. Uh, that's pretty much what he's going to be going through for the next few years, this young male. He's hanging out with a few ladies. Unfortunately, there's only so much protection they can afford him. But the way it works is when dad is not, when adult is not your dad, generally he'd give you a hiding or kill you. But every now and again, as with the Salt Lake Pride recently, recently we found two of the sausage tree pride males having a good time with the cubs. The sausage tree males from last year are all grown up, having now made themselves at home with the Salt Lake Pride. The Salt Lake Pride has experienced a baby boom of their own. So, rest for the Pride's members can be sporadic at best. Whereas, babysitting duties are spread amongst the Pride. Determined to keep as far away from the cub chaos as possible, the two males' moments of calm was quickly disturbed by some of the more brave cubs. Much to the relief of the Pride's females. Although cub mining does not come naturally to male lions, they are outnumbered and out of excuses, leaving them susceptible to becoming the cub's next plaything. Well, welcome back everybody. It's so nice to see the Salt Lake Pride uh, multiplying, and by the way that that male was interacting with those cubs, it is certainly, well, Either one of them is certainly the father. So you won't find males behaving like that around cubs, as far as I'm aware, only if they know who they are or if they are indeed the fathers. And well, so nice to see the sausage tree pride males, how much they've grown. Because pretty much last year, they were looking a little bit like this guy. The main development was there. Um, he's come on a long way since I saw him in November, December. Um, just compared to his sisters, he's so much bigger. And they seem to be trying to hide in the smallest bit of shade available. There's a little lugger over there with a bit of water. They've all gone there to drink um, as far away from the buffalo as is safe to do. Because over here, everybody, the flies are next level. Next level. And it's very interesting to see how the buffalo has been eaten. We haven't really managed to get a proper look at its belly. But it's only been sort of the hind quarters and the nose that have been eaten. And all five of the Awinos plus the big male lion of the Aldonia Pike Coalition, both are relatively it's bursting. And they're not as full as I've seen lions before. So maybe there was a little bit of conflict while we weren't watching. Uh, but we're standing by here because we've got a very strong feeling he's going to come back. And when he does, there's going to be all sorts of action over here. And, well, before we carry on, we're going to keep looking here, keep batting the flies away from our heads. And, well, Scuba Steve down South Africa, if he's got a problem with flies, he just goes under the water. Uh, undeniably more. Well, it's, it's more lively than the buffalo, certainly. I mean, that's not all that hard given that the buffalo is now dead but yeah well, that's about as lively as scuba steve and snorkel sarah have been that over there that we're looking at at the moment is i believe snorkel sarah wait no i always get the two of them confused yes that's sarah that's definitely sarah she's the smaller of the two 
difficult to tell the sex of a hippo unless it's you talking about a really big dominant bull like Steve. Steve is definitely a male, unequivocally a male. Sarah, well, are we certain? Well, apparently somebody's definitely confirmed that Sarah is in fact female. Um, whether or not this is indeed Sarah is also a tricky one to guess. Identifying features of a hippopotamus are tricky to find. I know, very controversial. We're all inclusive here at Safari Live, so whatever uh, Sarah happens to be, um, I hope she's happy. And you can see slight signs of restlessness with the hippo. And that, of course, is pretty inevitable as the water levels become more shallow. It becomes, the, the hippo become more and more uncomfortable with the area that they're in. The hippo, of course, always feels safer in slightly deeper water. Gizmo, you want to know when I think that Snorkel Sarah and Scuba Steve will make a move? I would guess that this is going to be dry probably at the end of May. Too dry for them, at least. However... Making a move is all fine and well, but as you know, Chitwa is actually quite dry as well. And there's not much space. All, this, all the available space is occupied by a hippo that already live there. So as to where Scuba Steve and Snorkel Sarah are going to go, I honestly do not know. And it's going to be particularly tough for Scuba Steve with his rock and roll lifestyle to find his way into, as a dominant male, to find his way into a new area. I'm not sure exactly, shame, look at them. They're trying to cool their backs down, lifting their legs up in the water. And that's why they're watching us so intently to make sure we don't, it's safe for them to actually roll over like that. It's also a little bit of a display and signs of anxiety in their body language. All right. Oh, well. is keeping his eyes peeled as he continues the search for some leopards. Well, it's been a pretty magical week with these leopards, although now and again they do give us a slip. But Tundi has hopefully got a it got a little surprise for us which we're hoping to find either today or in the next week's coming we hope that she has a den site and she might have some little ones there but until we see them we cannot confirm that for definite but with Talamba hanging around here they have been interacting every now and again but it's no book can actually show you what or how these elephants <laughs> interact as much as these two have for a mother-daughter relationship it's it's almost genetically you can definitely see that Talamba is Tandi's daughter and it's quite a special treat when you find them both together especially as all has our old Talamba is right now to where she should have separated a long time ago or a few months ago but the interaction just they keep bumping into each other and Tandi's been oh, she pretty good very relaxed about having her around although they seem to have a hard way of what do you call it a hard way of showing their love towards each other so we will see that in <laughs> what happened a few days ago when they bumped into each other <laughs> so like I said, it's very inter interesting to see them be together. So let's go back and see what they've been up to. Although one of the most successful leopardesses when it comes to rearing cubs, a gentle and tolerant approach to mothering is not exactly Tundi's style. And with the possibility of her next liver having arrived, she had little time for Talamba's shenanigans. However determined to exert a newfound independence, Talamba made sure to show her mum that she needs no help, out snarling Tandi on the odd occasion.
The two quickly, but they quarrel to rest when an unsuspecting hare hopped past. It was a great chance for us to see how far the little princess has come, though it's safe to say that she has a way to go before the strings are completely cut. Tandy was quick to follow as the two took down the small but tasty morsel. Having proven herself to her mother, Thalamba was rewarded and could revel in her spoils. So what did you think about that? It's very unusual to see a young leopard. She's what, 18 months now? And she is, they were actually hunting together. It doesn't, it was a probably a bit more of a coincidence that yes, they were, they happened to meet up and that a very, yeah, <laughs> the hare that was just decided to give up his life like that. And it, it just worked out that it almost looked like that they're hunting together and it ended up working out. But just that interaction between Tulumba and her mother and that Tulumba ended up feeding on that hare. It's very unusual to see, but like I said, not everything in the written in books is fact. What we see here is what we see. It's all new and exciting to all of us. Now we're still in the area where she's last seen. We're just going past the other watering hole where she, where she might still be hanging around. But it's really cool to watch that interaction and those eyes from Tandi <laughs> towards Talamba. But Talamba gave as much as, as good as she got. Okay, but well, while we're still on on drive looking for Talamba, let's go over to Steve with an update. Well, thanks, Rusty. Well, there's no better place, is there, to see leopards. Had a fantastic afternoon yesterday with the shepherd's tree mail. But um, that is another story right here. We finally got a hyena very tentatively making its way in. Um, it's staring in the direction where that male lion is. We can't see him anymore. I think he's crept around a giant rock that he was using for some shelter. But the hyena knows something is afoot. There's all sorts of smells on the wind. It's not just a dead buffalo. There are lions, more lionesses, and indeed there is a male lion somewhere around. And well, you know, in these situations, hyenas, if the meal is free, will go in and will eat as much of it as possible on its own without calling any friends. But if um, it needs help, okay. Oh, that James is looking at a jackal. James called me and I turned around and he was talking about a jackal. There we go. So, Belter, you want to know if the kill smells bad? The kill is unbelievably bad, uh, even after a day. It's been in the full sun all day and there are about 5 million and 10 flies on there. Now, go a bit closer, please, James. I want everybody to really see how many flies are on this buffalo. And that is just the area of the face that isn't even exposed. So as he keeps going, and you'll see that the lions are even are covered in it as well. So it is festering, and there are maggots growing in there, and it is already being broken down. But what I was saying before is hyenas will, will move into a kill like this, and they'll take as much as they can if it's for free, and they won't make a noise. But, for example, if they come into a scene and there's lions or hyenas or whatever it is they need help, that's when they use their communication to call in the clan. And uh, we've seen it. I've seen it with the Aweeno Pride last year. They killed a buffalo. I think it was the North Clan that came in and completely stole it from them. There was no competition whatsoever. The Wienos just laid it down and walked away. But in this situation, everybody, there is a big male lion. And as David Gitu was detailing the other day, you don't mess with a big male lion. No one really does. The only one who messes with a big male lion is another male lion. Okay, well, we do see all sorts of amazing things on the dam cam, and one of the special things we don't always see, but we hear, is the owls.
By the dam camp, we were also visited by one of those very much difficult birds to find. But here in Juma, we are so very lucky. I can promise you the bird we are going to see now is one of the birds which is very difficult to find as a guide. Where I come from, it was never easy. Look at that very beautiful bird looking at us. Look at those beautiful eyes. So these birds can be able to see very nicely at night. And they use their eyes again in order to advertise them, themselves for territoriality. So you'll see them changing their colors to yellow as well, just to advertise themselves and to show off the territorial display. If you look at those eyes, the eyes are much bigger than their sock, which makes it difficult for them in order to play their people like this. So instead, they must have to move the head so that they can be able to then see. They can't move the pupil like I'm doing now. It's very much difficult for them. So the eyes, the skull, if you can check, the eyes by the birds are much larger than their socks. And it looks like the skull is there in order to come accommodate these large eyes rather than the size of the brain. So the size of the brain is much smaller but the size of the eyes is much bigger. So that skull is there mostly to accommodate the large and uh, the large eyes. So this beautiful bird, let's see what this bird is thinking about here. We might see something interesting. You can see the bird has just landed now. That is by the uh, pen. Look at the beautiful face. Uh, this is amazing. And look at those, all those uh, beautiful feathers. That is why these kind of birds, they are very much popular when it comes to a silent flight. Just look at how densely populated are those feathers and all those small feathers. And if you look at those feathers by the legs, this is there's something interesting there. The birds which has got the feathers covering the legs, they are falling under a group which is called the true eagles. We have got true eagles and the non-true eagles. The non-true eagles are those birds who are just bare here by the portion of their legs. But those with hairs, you must know, it means those ones falls under a group of the true eagles. So let's see what is going to happen here. Maybe we might be lucky and see something interesting which took place at night. Look at that concentration of this very beautiful bird. Now he's on the ground. Let's just see. Maybe we might see he's looking at something and there is water nearby. You can see the reflection of the water and reflection of the bed. Look at that. The bed is going now deep in that kind of a small pen. And this is happening at night, remember. <laughs> Debra, me and you, we are all at the same page. Owls are so amazing. And that is why today I'm so happy to host you here by uh, exposing what is happening by the dam camp at night. So let's see here. This bed is now landed by the water hole. And this is happening at night. If it's during the day, I was going to say, yeah, the sun is too hot. Maybe the bed is now trying to cool the body uh, or else the bed is trying to do water bathing. Maybe this bed is feeling warm. If not feeling warm, it means this is about cleaning the body because these beds, they do also catch some of the parasites and dust bathing and also water bathing and something called hunting. It what helps these beds. I've never seen the, uh, the owls doing hunting at all. Hunting, the name says it all. These birds, they land on the ground and they let the ants to come and play on them and suddenly they provoke these ants. And the ants will react by releasing what is called formic acid. This formic acid can then serve as an antiparasitic in order to chase away their parasite. So let's see the intention of this uh, spotted eagle owl uh, or the Veroxus eagle owl here. You can see now that he's very much relaxed. Uh, this is about now uh, water bathing. This is amazing. He's hooked by a small piece of grass. What is happening there now is that that grass is coming from one of the die-hard die species. 
is coming from the coach grass. If this bird flies for a distance, hanging that grass, it is going to now serve as an agent of dispersal. So these birds, not only what they eat, they are going to defecate and plant trees. They can also drag some of the eggs from the fishes from one dam to the next. If not, this is uh, something which is a very good example. The bird has got a grass stuck on it. What if this bird flies and drop it somewhere else where the coach grass was never introduced? It means the owl is going to introduce something new in a very different area. So you can see even the beak is, there, is even cleaning the beak there at the moment. Uh, this is quite an amazing shot and all this has been taken by the dam cam. Now he's very much pretty relaxed there at the moment. Uh, earlier on by the very same dam cam, we saw the interaction of the puff adder and the other birds. These kind of big birds, the Veraxus eagles, their diet is consisted mostly of the rodents, but they do predate other small birds. So those birds, they can be vulnerable when these kind of big birds are in the area. Let's just see, maybe we might see this Veroxas. Oh, now the Veroxas eagle is going out. It looks like it's done now bathing. And something very important, I think this I must have to share with you, is that these birds, you must look at them. When they go to these pans and the big water holes, some of them, when they come out, they get wet. And some of them, their feathers are dry. What makes that? It is a special kind of a printing gland. It's called a uropygial gland. If you look at the bed, here at the back, they have got uh, some some lot of fats here next to their uh, uh, next to their uh, uh, cloaca just on top they have got a part where they can be able to turn their head and access that in order to put it on their feathers so that they can be able to prepare the feathers to try and help themselves as a waterproof when it's raining so that is amazing naturally these animals are equipped and they know what to do So now um, let's cross over to the gentleman, my friend. I have I'm missing for quite a long time. He's gone now. He is having the lions who also does some kind of a bath. <laughs> yes, this lion, this buffalo, everybody here could use a little bit of a bath. And well, now that you're back with us and well, we're looking at a dead buffalo, this week was quite a special week. We had that really large herd of buffalo that went a little bit crazy here and uh, we had two hyena moving in on the outskirts trying to disrupt them and we're pretty certain that there was some live birthing happening within the, the chaos. Uh, we didn't actually see any physical birth. We kind of saw one of the females walking around with what looked like a little bit of afterbirth or maybe even pre-birth uh, sticking out and we didn't actually see anything happen but then we were very lucky to watch them cross the road and very very wobbly legs so i've been very lucky and happy up in the mara the last two weeks with the amount of buffalo that we've been seeing and that line has had her fill of buffalo haven't you it keeps looking over at the male yeah, well donya payak is not the at the father of even these sub adults so they are a serious risk Ian, you want to know how long this kill will last, and it really depends on what happens after dark. Uh, I mean, I've got a very strong feeling in the next few moments or half an hour, whatever, that big male lion's going to come down here and just throw down a little bit of discipline. And then he's going to stay on this on his own, most likely, or he'll allow them to feed. It could last another day, last another half a day. It really depends on how many lions feed on it. But if the hyena come in as a clan, well, they'll clean it up very quickly. But um, it's unlikely that that will happen with a big male lion present. But it's one of those things you never know. Um, vultures could tear a buffalo apart in a matter of, of a couple of hours. Uh, normally in the migration, there are hundreds, thousands of vultures around. I um, haven't seen many in my time since I've been here. And there's not a single one here today. And Aina is watching that male lion. <laughs> He's going, hello. Where are you? Well, she's going. 
So the temperature has dropped a bit. The sun has gone behind the mountain. And there's a very good chance we're going to probably start hearing some noises or seeing some action because that is one of the highlights the dam cam has provided over the last many years is always the sounds. Uh, the owls, sometimes they can create a little bit of a drama. I'm just going to remind you uh, something that maybe some of you have witnessed before. This happened here in Juma. I was on a game drive one afternoon and I was having a very good sighting of Hosanna who was feeding on one of the dead Nyalas. Unfortunately, it was like where the Nyala was, 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 was taken, dragged by Hosanna. It was under the tree where the eagles or the owls, spotted eagle owls were nesting. And they were very much vocal. They were trying by all means to attack him on the ground. And they were coming every time down to attack him. So these birds, sometimes they can be very much protective in their territory. So now I am just going to uh, carry on uh, from previous so that we can see what suddenly transpired. Look, now we can see that Verexas eagle is lucky. So it's not all about coming to clean himself by the water hole. He knows that when coming to have something, uh, he can also clean himself. So it means the intentions was just not about to come and clean. It was both hunting and also coming to cool or to clean himself. Here we have got evidence. Look at that. Well, let's see what he's eating. You can see that looks like a frog. He's having a frog hanging on his mouth at the moment. He's trying to uh, uh, take some, some pieces and uh, suddenly he might swallow the whole body. And after swallowing the body, because the frog is too small, it's not going to make a very big difference. Because these kind of beds, because they've got to uh, take off from the ground and fly high, they don't have to spend much time having a lot of food in the digestive system. The beds, in two hours, three hours, they can be able to digest just something like seeds completely so that they can always lower their weight in, in order to uh, fly uh, very fast and in order to fly very high. Look at that. You can see he's using his talons in order to grab when he's trying to uh, take off some of the pieces. Now I'm going to show you something. Uh, I do have a very interesting history and I have got a mark and this mark it will never be erased. At one stage while I was growing I used to do some bed hunting and suddenly those things turned into conservation uh, focus. When I was doing that I once shot a buzzard and the buzzard before that buzzard died I went on the ground and grabbed it but the tolons look at what the tolons did. I have got a very big scratch mark there which is now forming part of my fingerprints every time I go for any fingerprint I've got this <laughs> I've got this mark this is from the buzzard uh, so now let's go back to uh, this um, beautiful owl and see what is going to happen afterwards you can see now he's using his right foot in order to bring everything much closer maybe now it's time for him to swallow everything look at that uh, quickly like that they don't chew. It's gone now. Disappeared. So it means he's got, and he's still looking. You can see there, he's looking. Ah, oh, now it's time for him to have some drink. He must at least get a wash down uh, because he just had something delicious. <laughs> this is helping. You can see there is a very interesting balance. These frogs, some other animals must come and eat. But who predate the frogs the most is not him. It is uh, this what is called the ground hornbill. I once saw the ground hornbill with two beds, holding two beds on his beak. So the owls are also making a difference here by the dam cam. So I can see that now uh, that bed is full and maybe it's time for the bed to go back uh, to where he's coming from or maybe it's the time for him to keep uh, watching in order to get more and more because we don't know how hungry uh, that uh, eagle owl is it was a wow sighting seeing this uh, kind of an eagle owl in action, the giant eagle owl in action but now something interesting is happening with steve by the masai mara Yes, indeed. Well, look at that. 
the jackal snuck in and he's picked up what looks like a piece of buffalo hide. I'm not quite sure. And this lioness is being very greedy. You know, the jackal could barely carry it, it was so heavy. And this lioness has got an entire buffalo to herself and she's going to go and fight with this jackal over a mere little bit of skin. That's very rude. Very rude. But that is competition, everybody. That's how it works out in the African wilderness. And the pecking order will always be male lion down to prides of lion. Hyenas will be in there somewhere next to prides of lion. And then obviously lone hyenas come in low down. And then a jackal right down at the bottom. And they always keep to the periphery. But in saying that, the man, that jackals are going to sneak right back in because they are not scared at all. They know they can keep their distance from lions. They do the same with leopards as well. And uh, they are scavengers of note and opportunistically able to just pick up and take whatever they need. <laughs> Look at that. That is a very nice prize you've got there. I don't really know what it is yet. I'm going to try and have a little look as well. James has obviously got it on screen, but it's very hard if he's not picking it up. Got a bit of meat on there. It might be an internal organ. Deborah, well, jackals and foxes are very much closely related. So we, we do get foxes in Africa. And they do look very, very similar. And I suppose coyotes as well are very similar. Even dingoes in, South, in uh, Australia look very similar. They've, and the hyena's going to say, okay, well, here's the pecking order for you. The hyena's going to maybe try to steal that from the jackal. Mine. There we go. You can see pecking order there, everybody. And just look at the strength. Okay, that looks like a bit of internal organ. I'm not sure what it is. If anyone out there is very easily able to identify bits of meat please let me know what that might be but this hyena is going to take that prize somewhere away where it can eat it in peace <laughs> and notice it's taking it as far away from the male line as it possibly can oh very good leave the jackal shaking his head in disbelief that was his but jackal you've got the whole buffalo now to yourself there's no lions nearby yet although the pride is slowly getting up they've suddenly noticed the hyena look at the pride on the left there james they've all got their heads up now after having a little bit of a drink <laughs> every you're a funny man dr jackal and mr hyde very clever indeed so now the lions regardless of how full they are competition is rife out here and if they don't compete for their food they will lose it and that's not how they've evolved that's not how hyenas have evolved it's not how jackals have evolved and look this lioness is going to walk all the way over to the hyena and she's going to give him oh, <laughs> a bit of a stumble you know maybe give it a bit of a hard time but hyenas are able to devour food very quickly this is what they do they can put about 30 odd pounds into their belly in one go so we'll turn around, show its back to the wilderness and stare down the lion and it can gorge as much as it possibly can. 16 kilograms, 32 odd pounds and then can carry away a very large piece of meat uh, to then maybe to cubs or uh, somewhere else. We've seen them stashing them, dam cams even seen them stash them in Fuertela Pan. A little bit too far away now for that lioness. The lioness was starting to stalk towards it. But uh, we are going to stay right here because I think the action is going to start, really start out unfolding as that male lion decides to wake up. But in the meantime, down to Juma once again with Jamie. I do actually, and I'm quite surprised at how chilled this giraffe really is. Because typically you'll find in open spaces like this, and particularly around water at this time of year, the animals are actually quite nervous around the water's edge, which is entirely understandable. And no more, it's especially true of giraffe, and I find with a hippo we spoke about earlier but giraffe in particular a lot of the time when we see them they aren't a hundred percent comfortable around vehicles and they just decide that our presence is just that little bit too much uh oh incoming attack attack impala oh he was running straight at us oh dear oh shame 
Now he wants to come this way. I don't want to move and frighten him even more. It's okay, boy. It's all right. He was charging right at us, BK. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Okay, we just sit still so we don't panic him any further. Shame he's got to pick his way through the, the brush packing on the side of the dam. That's there to prevent erosion, but it also makes life tricky. But there we go. He's found his way down and away from the other male. Right, back to the giraffe. All that dramatics. I hope she's still there. She is low weight. Oh, dear. Okay. All right. We'll get back to this giraffe in a bit. First, you go across to Steve, because apparently there's more action with the hyenas. Yes, right, everybody. The lioness started stalking this hyena and uh, hid behind a termite mound and uh, was very flat in the ground. The hyena kind of just moved a little bit further away. But watch, here we go. All the lions want to have a go at this hyena and they're using the termite mound at their advantage. Watch here. Watch here. They don't know who, where each other is. Are you ready? This could go any way, everybody. Oh! A little bit too much meat in your belly. <laughs> <laughs> that is the survival arch everyone it is the eternal enemies hyena versus lion it doesn't matter how much food they've got they are not sharing it with a lowly hyena come on now just like the lion the hyena will not share with the lions but this is the sort of time where you'd start expecting that hyena there to start calling in some reinforcements um, maybe it knows there's a male lion, so there's no point. It's just going to try and scoff whatever scraps it can get. Um, but now, because the hyena's on the scene, these lions are all probably going to move back to their kill over here so they can safeguard it because it's very quick, very easy for a clan of hyenas to suddenly come in. And if they've got the ground on top of the buffalo, then they are much better than if if they are further away. Running in trying to displace the hyenas is a little bit more hard. Lions like to hold the fort, as it were. Okay, well, we're going to stay here, everybody. I'm sure all the lions are going to come in. I'm sure we're going to start hearing some calling soon. But let's go back down to Jamie, whose giraffe is being cleaned by some ox pickers. Uh, she doesn't look too distressed by the ox peckers, certainly not as distressed as the lions might be at the thought of their meal being stolen. Now our lovely lady giraffe has been having a drink and the ox peckers have taken this opportunity to settle in for some evening feeding before it's time for them to return to their nesting sites. Is she going to drink again? Is she going to drink again? Come on girl, one more time for us because it's always so entertaining watching a giraffe drink. Yes, no? No, we're going to clean our nostrils instead. There we go, there we go. Oh, no, well, yes, no, yes, no, yes. There we go. There we go. And now she... <laughs> Here we are. So that typical splayed leg approach. Oh, the other giraffe, they don't have many options because their neck is around about two meters long. And their legs are pretty long too, so there's that characteristic flick of the head. And she's, oh, there's a second giraffe. My goodness gracious. We're being spoiled this afternoon. Someone else is coming in for a drink as well. I've been sitting here entertaining myself, thinking about what dam cameras would have seen if they were set up at places like Twin Dams and Buffelshook. And essentially, another excuse to reminisce on some of the sightings we've had. If there'd been a dam cam at Twin Dams, oh, there's zebras coming too. Everyone's coming for a drink. But if there'd been a dam cam at Twin Dams, you would have seen the Styx cubs back in 2015 when Scott Dyson first found them on my interview drive. And the lesson that Karula taught Shungile and Hosanna, where the crocodiles were concerned, that was here too. That's what I've been doing to keep myself entertained, but now I don't have to reminisce at all because there's exciting things happening here now. A herd of zebra making their way down, giraffe. It's all happening here at Twin Dams. I wonder if this is the same zebra herd that Sydney had with the baby in it. I haven't seen a sign of a foal yet, but they haven't all arrived. This is beautiful. I'm just going to let you listen and watch for a second. A 
a short second of silence for you all before you head back across to Sydney. I hope you all have your tissues out for the next story is something of a sad one. Uh, for the benefit of those who has just joined us now, the main focus of today's Safari Lives is the untold stories of the dam camp. Things have been happening during the night while we are sleeping. Animals are interacting there by the dam camp. And now I am going to be heading towards a very good sighting which has been captured for the one bird that is very popular in the area, which is a school bird. Look at that. You can see that we have got the uh, kivet. This is the blacksmith plover. Uh, the blacksmith plover is having a small little chick there. And you can see the chick is following the mother all the time. Something very interesting I must share with you about these mothers. When they are having the eggs and when having the little ones, they can be very much protective. And they have got a very interesting anti-predatory strategy which is called a distracting behavior. Uh, this distracting behavior has got something to do with faking of a situation. This is what they're going to do. They are going to, to do like this. They're going to pretend as if they've got a broken wing. And when pretending as if they've got a broken wing, if there is a predator, instead of a predator to go towards the little one, is going to concentrate on an easy meal. And when coming to the easy meal, the easy meal is going to fly. And that is going to make the predator very difficult to reallocate where the predator was when the first, first focus was. Isn't that amazing? So you can see these birds are so very much amazing. Let's see what is going to happen here. You can see the little one is also uh, a, a giving uh, himself a little bit of a bite this is amazing look at that so uh, these little birds because they are permanent residents by the surrounding of the water holes they are very much vulnerable because if you can check now i think it's important that we think about the seasonal changes when the season is changing by the very same dam camp we have witnessed quite a lot of large heads of buffaloes we have seen large heads of elephants and other different species and these animals when they are so thirsty and coming from a long distance coming close to the water hole sometimes they start running and the chances of destroying and distracting some of the ground dwellers nests they are always very high so let's see what is going to happen here you can see that little one is now under a very strong scrutiny of the mother at the moment. Uh, this is cute. Look at that. That baby looks very beautiful. Uh, I, and the color of the, of the baby, look at that, is completely different from the color of the mother, which means the little one is equipped with some camouflage so that they can blend with the surrounding when they are sitting on the floor because it looks completely brown. Look at that. Now we have got this bed and all we can see is four legs. The bears don't have four legs. You can see this means that the little one was somewhere there hidden by the tummy of the parent. And that was something very special to see as it can confuse you from a distance. But because we know and we saw that the dam camp managed to get both of them, we know it means that was the little one. So you can see the little one is also now starting to forage. Uh, so uh, these birds uh, can be so very much interesting uh, because uh, the school bed, if you can check now, is concentrating on some of the things. But considering the age, I don't think the digestibility of a school bed is ready yet in order to deal with the solids. It must be maybe at this stage dealing with some of the very soft. But anyway, by the water holes, animals who are staying there, they don't have very strong and hard uh, hard skin so maybe that is why uh, this kind of bed uh, is concentrating here by uh, this uh, water hole at the moment and uh, this story of scuba it doesn't end there a uh, scuba uh, is still here now uh, with the mother you can see now we can see scuba is uh, starting to grow up look at that that body size is much better oh scuba is even now in search of food just by the elephant dung hmm? it's taking the responsibilities of the dung beetles now eh? it's destroying the food for uh, my favorite insects look at that 
<laughs> so here by these dungs, by the elephant dungs, there is quite a lot of variety of insects and a lot of different species of birds can utilize that as their diet because you will find the ants, sometimes you will find the termites and you will even find some of the other insects hiding there, even flies. Some of those birds who catch flies can even get flies there. So you can see elephant dung can then serve as a major source of food in order to distribute to quite a lot of various species. So Scubert was one of the beneficiaries. We have witnessed that. You can see she is just there at the moment. So unfortunately, uh, Scubert uh, was one of <laughs> is that, uh, that is very true it is very much sad and disappointing that Scubert's life was cut short but I'm sure the reason why the life of Scubert was cut short was due to seasonal changes because the pen is so perennial the perennial areas is those areas which are, uh, are running or giving animals food or water all year round because of that reason we got animals who then starts to consider those places as their area in go and, and go in order to in, to search for water. So these end up also attract predators. So let's 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 consider this broadly because if let's say we have got buffaloes coming in in Juma, it is obvious in a few days time we are going to have the Unkuhumas coming. So you can see that the water hole sometimes brings both prey and predators to come and interact. That is why the very same dam came, showed us a lot of dakers drinking in the middle of the night because they are minimizing the interaction with these very big predators. So now let's cross over to Jamie, who is also by one of the waterholes, but unfortunately by Jamie's there is no dam camp. I am. And I was sitting with the world's most tolerant giraffe lady, but now she's decided she's had enough of us. And, well, actually, I think it's more that she'd had enough of the nomthorn that she was eating. And she's now moved off back towards the water's edge. Just look at her assortment of ox peckers sitting on her neck. That's awesome. One, two, three, four, five. All gathered together, having a merry time of things. There's a little juvenile with his black bill, or her. And then there's the adults there with their red beaks. And I was just saying to BK, it almost looks like a sort of stop motion effect. I wonder what it's like living your life on the shoulders of giants, quite literally. And the reason that I came to this waterhole actually was in search of elephants, because although I'll never be quite as tiny as an ox picker, I did. I do know sort of what it feels like when elephants are right up close to the vehicle. Look how beautiful she is. Look at those lovely eyelashes. Thanks, girl. You're being very, very tolerant here. A couple of Mapani bees and flies hanging around her eyes. Isn't she gorgeous? Absolutely lovely. I think there's even a possible she possibility she might be pregnant. Ah, now Avery, that's a very good question and highly appropriate for the name Avery. Avery wants to know what animals ox peckers will perch on and feed off the most. To be honest, most of the herbivores from around about impala sized up, you will you will find ox peckers on them. Rhino, hippo giraffe, lots of the antelope species, and buffalo as well. What we have noticed here with uh, the ox peckers is that when we've seen yellow-billed ox peckers, which is the other species to see out here, what we have noticed is when we have seen yellow-billed ox peckers, they've been on buffalo. I have not seen here, uh, personally, I have not seen yellow-billed ox peckers on anything else. In the Mara, yellow-billed ox peckers are actually quite common and you'll see them on other animal species as well. The way they're using their tail feathers and their claws to comb through the fur. I was talking about what it might must be like to live on such a large animal and speaking about my impressions 
of feeling very small when surrounded by elephants, which is, of course, what greeted me when I returned from leave earlier this week. For all ladies of a certain age, youthful exuberance inevitably gives way to quiet confidence and invaluable self-assurance. Maggie Smith and Fang are both examples of this. Certainly it takes a special kind of confidence to enjoy food with such gusto and, to be frank, to unabashedly display such an impressive amount of facial hair. All good friendships survive extended periods of separation and for me at least, it felt as though nothing had changed. Under her calm leadership, Fang's herd has clearly flourished since I last saw them. In perfect contrast to their venerable matriarch, the youngsters of Fang's herd seem determined to make an impression, drawing courage from each other's boldness. Moments like this are a privilege. They're also always too short, and Fang's herd marched off for a drink, having infinitely enriched my day. I can't say actually that I've ever had a day where the day hasn't been enriched by spending time out here, but elephant sightings like that are really special. And to catch up with Fang again after nearly, I would say probably two years, was extra special. And of course, she shares in common with this giraffe a vast amount of facial hair. There you go, this lovely lady giraffe has also got a beard that she should be proud of. Probably, of course, in fact, definitely because and they feed off very similar things, often very spiky trees where it pays to be able to know exactly where your mouth is, lest you find yourself impaled. Now, Fang, of course, and really, really a special elephant herd, because I think I even saw my special little elephant male. Right, well, from a bearded creature to one who is a clean-shaven as always, let's go across to the well-groomed Rusty. <laughs> those, ele those little elephants are taking on the vehicle. They are incredible animals. And when they are that small, they think the whole world, they're almost like Jack Russells at heart, where they would take on bigger things. But with a help of the parents right behind them, with mum right behind them, they seem to think, okay, they've got the, they can take on anything. But talking about leopards earlier, I'm still looking for evidence. We have found one set of fresh tracks that we believe are from this morning, and it belongs to one of the male leopards in the area. We are not too sure which one, but it could be Tingana, it could be Hokumori, and it could be one of there's a young male leopard that hangs around the area here and we don't see him very often but he does move through here sometimes all we find is tracks so it could be one of the three males i am not too sure so we're just trying to do a loop around to see if we can at least find where the, he comes out of the drainage line here so while we're talking on the topic of hukumuri the hook meaning chicken medicine very unusual for a leopard Let's find out what he got up to at the beginning of the week. These days, Hukumori seems to radiate confidence. Secure in his dominance, he walks as a swagger of a boxer. Even on a standard territorial patrol, he looked as though he had come from a bar brawl. With Tangana otherwise occupied with family matters, Hukumori proceeded without a care in the world, stopping every now and again to leave his mark behind. His visits to Juma are always fleeting, and with such a large territory, his attention was clearly needed further south. He is definitely a monster of a leopard. He is huge. You see the size of his neck and shoulders. He is quite an impressive thing. Sorry, I'm just reversing a little bit. There was a... Okay, all I can smell is gasoline now from the vehicle. But no, it might just be my imagination. I did ingest a stink bug earlier, which I think has confused my senses. I thought I smelled something dead. Okay. 
Lauren, do you think that Tandi has moved dens since she's run into Hokumori? I believe she might have. Um, there's, we, we don't even know where the exact den is yet or whether or not she even has a den. Whether moving it now, we're not too sure. In the, part, in the last few days, if she has moved, if she even has a cub. I cannot answer that truthfully. We are still looking into whether or not she's even produced any cubs. This, uh, there was sign of her being very large and then very thin, losing all that, that round belly, losing that round belly she had what, about two weeks ago. So we are not too sure. Um, yes, there is a chance of her moving it, especially well, because she's more a more dominant, yeah, since Okamori is quite dominant and it can be a bit of a threat to the cubs since they might not even be his. So yes, there is a chance she might have moved them if she has them. How are you doing? Good. So while we talk, uh, while we are looking for any of the leopards, let's go back up to Steve. Well, let's hope we are able to find Tandy at some stage with her potentially new cubs. It's all been very exciting up here in the Mara, waiting to hear if anyone finds her with cubs or a den site. But uh, alas, we haven't yet heard any news. So the male lion is still off on the right, but his head is finally up, which means that maybe he's going to get up and come over here. Uh, for now though, can you see him James? His head has just come up. He's been flat all afternoon and uh, well he's just there by the rock. Are we ready for it? Three, two, one, there he is. Now that, oh there we go, that shows us exactly how he's feeling. That rock has been in shade for a very long time so that was the perfect spot to go and lie up and uh, he's been constantly getting stares well, look at that. The hyenas are coming, everybody. There's four. There are two more in front of us. So, and it's starting to spice up. It's incredible because there hasn't been a sound made. Not a single noise has been uttered by these hyenas that we know about. Maybe they've gone and they're millennial hyenas and they've all got WhatsApp and they've messaged each other in a group chat and have said there is a buffalo kill on this road and we need some assistance. I think that's what's happened because I haven't heard anything. But anyway, while we wait for this to happen, uh, lions don't just kill buffalo. Lions have to go through all sorts of stages, all f sorts of life lessons before they can upgrade to killing of one of the largest beasts on the African plain. For cubs of all kinds, it's difficult to tell where playing stops and learning begins. Often, playtime can be seen as an opportunity for young ones to test run their skills. In this case, a large porcupine appeared to have wandered into an unexpected lesson for the Salt Lake Pride's cubs. Although, you would expect that a ball of sharp quills would be a less than ideal chew toy, the cubs Curiosity couldn't help them wanting to investigate. As the adults initially stood by to observe, the cubs' uninhibited approach shifted as the porcupine, standing as big as possible, was less than impressed by his involuntary part in this lion cub lesson. Satisfied with the tutorial, the protective adults moved on, pulling the inquisitive cubs away leaving the terrified porcupine to carry on with his business. Well, everybody, here we are with the Owino Pride, and they've gone through all the lessons to upgrade to killing this buffalo. And it's not the first migration. This will be probably the third migration for these youngsters. So they're definitely learning how it's done. And the young male, he had an injury last year. I remember all of you might have seen that big gash on the inside of his leg. And that was apparently from a buffalo. So he was very, very tentative last night in his approach. Uh, just like the uh, Salt Lake Pride females were very tentative in their sort of approach to that porcupine. Because, you know, there's a technique to it. 
and you know you can get it right and you can get it right but you know what it's like in life if you get something wrong the first time you you're generally pretty reluctant to try it again what's that old saying if you fall off the horse you've got to get back on um, if you don't get back on the horse well you lose the ability to really figure out exactly how that works you know like I nearly drowned surfing once and it took me a good year and a half to get back in the water surfing so it's one of those things you get a little bit scared but what's happening over here now they're starting to mass I counted six hyena you saw before when James framed there were four there were four and now there were six and now that individual we had two of them in front of us one has gone racing off there I think they're gonna have a little bit of a group chat a group huddle and they're gonna go okay where's the lion at where's the females at but I have a feeling we're going to get all sorts of things because I know hyenas would know this is the we know pride but it's probably the big male that they're smelling I think we need to attach a smell meter to the dam cam so we can not only hear and see the lions we can also smell them Not only these small animals has been caught by this dam cam, the big animals as well has been involved on the interactions during the night. We are going to see those big animals now interacting here by the dam cam. Look at that. We have got the hippopotamus who is just utilizing the pen and not very far away from the hippopotamus. You can see the largest land mammal is also passing by. The intentions maybe for this uh, beautiful largest land mammal is to come and drink. If not, maybe is heading much more towards the next pen. As away from this pen we are seeing now, there is another pen called the Galago pen, which is also one of the perennial pens in the area. So these uh, beautiful hippopotamus here, let's see what is going to happen. Oh, even the scrub hairs. We saw the scrub hairs as well. You can see now the elephant is uh, uh, looking at the hippopotamus and the hippopotamus is not worried at all uh, at the moment uh, because they might have been interacting a lot maybe at night by the very same pen if not by the other big water holes what is forcing the hippopotamus to come here by this time of the night it is the seasonal changes if you can check let's just look at the surrounding the surrounding of this pen, you can see it's looking very much dry and there are no grass there. That gives you an indication that this has been taken during the dry season. And dry season is associated with the drying out of some of the non-perennial water holes, like when you go to the Buffalo's Hook. Like we saw now that the water at the Buffalo's Hook Dam is getting very low, which means the hippopotamus such as scuba steve, they must have to then move to where the water is available as they do need this water for their survival so let's let's carry on from previous and see what is exactly going to happen here you can see the elephant is trying to uh, use his auto factory by the trunk is trying to sniff there on the ground elephants are part of those who's got a very good auto factory system what is the altofactory system? This is a kind of a communication where the animals can be able to easily pick up the scent and judge and know what is happening in the surrounding. We mostly see these kind of behaviors di uh, displayed by the animals when they're trying to detect ostras, but it's not all about ostras. So let's see what is going to happen there. You can see the largest land mammal has just gone past and the hippo is very much settled at the moment just by the very same area. So the interaction between these two, I didn't see any sign of aggression amongst them. Rosalind, thank you very much for such a beautiful question. The hippopotamus, uh, he is in water at the moment, but they can be able to survive in water and outside. Yes, animals who does survive in both land and in water, we call them amphibians. So this hippopotamus, he must have to leave the water holes every day if possible in order to go and search for some food. And distances can also occur because available 
availability of food sometimes can be very much scarce, which will then force them to go long distance. Sometimes they don't even come back to the waterholes. They can be able to hide by the shades and by the riverbeds and carry on afterwards. So these animals, due to the seasonal changes, they do experience quite a lot. So now, uh, let's cross over to one of the animals who doesn't mind as well traveling for a long distance in search of food, the hyenas. Indeed, so the seasonal changes are one of the biggest driving forces behind the purpose of the migration that happens here. And the lions and hyena clans have to, uh, well, have to change their diet. Uh, Lions have to switch to a diet of buffalo, which is obviously a bit more dangerous. And well, hyena, I don't really know what they switch to. I think they just still take whatever they can. But definitely during the migration, the wildebeest is the order of the day. We're just watching. There's seven hyenas coming now. Uh, there's still one that's been lying down where we've left him a while ago, or her. I have no idea what clan this is, everybody. We're quite far sort of uh, west along the escarpment and they seem to come down from the escarpment so I'm really not sure but uh, it is very interesting to see how tentatively they're coming in I'm sure a lot of it's got to do with the fact they can smell a male lion on the wind some of you are wondering if the lions would be able to pull this up into the tree not a chance that buffalo is enormous there is still probably 700 pounds on there maybe more Probably even more than that. I mean, there's still bones. There's, they haven't eaten a lot. Um, people say lions can eat a fifth of their body weight a day. Uh, six lions have probably eaten about, what's that, about 200 kilograms off of an eight, 900 kilogram buffalo. So you're looking at still 600, so still a thousand pounds probably. But that is just me doing a bit of a rough math. Um, Come on, guys. This is what I've been waiting for. This is when the clan starts to bolster their numbers and bolster their confidence. And this individual is the first one we saw that came and stole that little bit of food and challenged the lionesses. And now the friends are coming. And you know what it's like when suddenly you've got a whole bunch of mates to come and help you. <laughs> and like I said, you know, like down in Juma, the hyenas know each and every leopard they know each and every lion, and they know the risks that come with that. For example, a hyena smells Tlalumba. They're just going to run in there and chase off a kill. Uh, these hyenas know who their wieners are, and they probably, most of the time, chase their wieners off kills because their wieners are quite a, you'd say, quite a weak pride because they've only got two strong lionesses, adults. The youngsters are still a little bit sort of unsure of what's going on. But uh, they've been very tentative around skirting around the edge of that male lion. But we might see them come in. And there's one thing that history has taught us that nothing dislikes, well, a male lion hates nothing more than a hyena. And well, as we watch this youngster get a bit bolder, his friends coming to join him from behind, I'm sure we're going to be blessed with some wonderful sounds soon. And that male lion is probably going to come through and bat them around. But anyway, Jamie Patterson, the hyena queen, she seems to have found herself one of the Juma clan. I do, I actually have several, but as it happens, this is as close as we can get to the rest of them because our way is blocked by the lovely ribbon. So there we go, definitely the new den. Definitely a den site. I haven't seen them use in a very, very long time. Although Brent disagrees. I told him that they have moved and he says they used this den recently. I don't know how that's possible. But anyway, there we go. The lovely ribbon is sleeping off the rigors of motherhood away from the rest of the clan. Of course, as a low-ranked female, she finds life a little bit tough especially at a communal den site. I've noticed when her cubs were little, and I'm so excited actually, because it's the first time I've seen them since I came back from leave, and I can see them just behind her. Come on, come to your mommy. Come to your mommy. 
I, I noticed when the cubs were young that uh, Ruben got bullied all the time. There they are, all the way at the back there. Hey, cuties, look, you've got your spots. <laughs> Last time I saw you, you were just little wobbly black things. Now look at you. You're still wobbly. And now you've got little spots. Oh, marvellous. Three months now? End of Feb, end of March, end of April. No, there must, there must be about three months. Close on three months. All right. Now, one of the reasons I think that Ribbon hasn't gone up closer to the den is because June is fast asleep there. And as many of the Juma clan members have realized, June is not to be trifled with. My personal feeling is that nothing embodies the word obsequious better than a low-ranking hyena approaching one of their superiors. Where June is concerned, this terror was fully justified. For such a young hyena, June takes her duties as a relatively high-ranked clan female very seriously. Even her own cubs are visibly wary of their mother. One would think that as a millennial mother, June might take a more lenient line in raising her cubs, but this is clearly far from the reality. She clearly learned her no-nonsense approach from her own mother, Scarback. However, strict parenting does not automatically mean a lack of care, and June has clearly done a fantastic job in raising her first litter and cares for them deeply. By finding the perfect balance between discipline and love, her cubs are thriving. That's June over there, I think. Obviously now it's starting to get a little bit dark and very shortly we're going to have to switch to IR. Look, 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 that shy approach, of course, as Ribbon's Cubs, they haven't really got the best of the clan hierarchy spots. They're right down at the bottom, so they have to be very well behaved. I think there's actually, you know, I think that's June. Pretty certain that's June, but you can see how, well, obsequious the little cubs are being in their approach. Very, very servile. All right. Okay, we're gonna equip ourselves for nighttime filming now that we are with the lovely hyenas while we do. Off you pop across to Steve, who probably has beaten us to it. Thanks, Jamie. Well, we are with a very sleepy, very non-interested lioness right here. Uh, three members of the pride are busy eating. You can see the male has got his eyes trained on the male lion who is still lying down and slowly in the background you can see the hyenas massing there but off to the left and I don't know if those hyenas know it just off to the left the one lioness has actually hidden herself behind that termite mound there and I think she maybe wants to try and catch one of these hyenas I think it was butternut I'm not sure one of the adult lionesses doesn't like hyenas at all Maybe it's lychee, in fact. It's butternut lying here. But one of those hyenas is going to catch a hiding in a moment because there's a lion hiding behind that termite mound. They are getting braver. They are moving closer. That's what I saw when this pride killed that wildebeest and the happy zebra clan, or it might have been the north clan, I can't remember, moved in and took over. But before the hyenas actually filled their ranks and moved in, the lions just ate as much as they possibly could. Every hyena, for the most part, will hunt the easiest option, as will ever any predator. So there's a reason why these hyenas got this buffalo last night, was because it was available. Um, so hyenas will, will take out the weakest individual. If they come across a buffalo herd and they can se segregate or sort of separate a female or a calf, they will definitely take that one. If it happens to be a big, big bull that they get off on their own, They'll do that. Brent last year had uh, the Talek clan on the other side of the river chase down a topi. 
So it really depends on, on what's going. They, they have a knack for it, like wild dogs, lions, and for picking up the weakest. And hyenas are able to work a herd and work a herd, and when they see weakness, then they go for the easiest, because that is how it works out here. It's kind of that natural sort of uh, a way of thinning the population, of removing the injured, the lame, the sick. Obviously, sometimes they catch fully, st uh, full strong animals, uh, but they don't. I don't think they got a preference. They'll also feed on bones and carcasses that are quite rotten and quite ripe. So they are also the cleaners of the bush. So, well, we're going to stay right here until the action unfolds. So let's see what happens with these lions and hyenas. And meantime, down in Juma, Rusty has found an antelope. Well, we are I got a fading light very quickly here. It's coming into late evening. And there was a brief update on Talamba. One of the other vehicle, game drive vehicles around here had seen her very briefly as she crossed over and disappeared into one of the larger blocks around here. Well, the blocks were referring to one of the areas just to the left of us and this kudu that we've just been looking at was actually very intently looking in to the left of us and we are i was actually hoping for it to spot it for us so it at least gives us an indication where she might have gone in but it's extremely thick to the left of me and <laughs> there's not going to be any chance of us spotting her in there unless we move around so we're going to just do another loop around the block and hopefully she makes an appearance on the road. Otherwise, is this gonna be up to a spotlight and hopefully find some eyes reflecting back. But it's actually pretty impressive, these kudu that I have. Steve, did you say, <laughs> did leopards have a favorite type of food? This is definitely, can be one of their favorite foods, but this adult bull here is definitely not uh, the size of their normal prey. That is a very large bull. But a kudu calf can be easily be taken down by a, a adult male leopard. But even an adult female will take on a small young calf. But a bull that size, has a leopard has no chance against that bull. Now, it's actually quite an interesting case that's going on here. We've actually got two bulls that have been having a go each, at each other for the last five minutes here. They're, it is coming into the rutting season, so these bulls, I think, tonight... It's actually it's too hard to see now, the bush is very thick. But these bulls tonight, I think, will have a go at each other throughout the night. They'll be fighting for the females that they're following at the moment. And it's very impressive to watch when they when that does happen. But sadly, the bush is very thick, so there is no chance of being able to see that. So, well, I'm gonna try and see if we can find Talamba. In the meantime, let's go back up to Jamie at the Hina Den. Alright, so I don't have to use my spotlight because we, of course, have our infrared all sorted out. Well done, in BK. And we're at the lovely new Juma clan den. And what a lovely den site it is. This is such a good spot where they found themselves. Look at this, Ribbon and June's cubs. You can really get an idea of the size difference between the two different litters. June's, of course, about two months older. And ribbons and ribbons little ones going to be bullied no matter what no matter which adult unless maybe heart comes and joins the gang and has cubs of her own oh <laughs> shame see how scared they are of her they're making little crying sounds little begging sounds known as squittering by the Mara Hyena researchers. Hello, you lot. You made our lives very difficult last night. Yes, you did. Now, are you gonna do it to me again? We're all going to go right up to the front of the car and then <laughs> the poor cameraman has to struggle to film them. So last night, Plonk picked up a dead mongoose and it had clearly been, hello, hello. I'm gonna stick my head round. 
Hello, you two. You full of nonsense. Yes. Yes, if you learned bad habits from your older clan mates. Sorry, guys. I know you can't actually see. Yes, no, please leave my car alone now. Anyway, so... I'm just going to turn my game drive radio down. So last night, Plonk picked up a very smelly, really, truly disgusting dead mongoose. He definitely didn't kill it himself. And he was having so much fun. Every time he realized that he was alone with it, he picked it up and went trotting off. Oh, quickly, let's try and get a sex of that cub. That looks like a female to me. Can I see the other one? Male, I think don't go straight off it necessarily it's really difficult Ooh. oh no don't chase him away june oh. let's try again there bk if we can get the sex of these cubs yeah that looks like a female to me Ooh. oh no stay still oh it's hard to tell at this age in this light those of you who have the screenshot capacity, please screenshot. I know this sounds like a very strange thing to those who are new to these safaris and probably to BK too. Um, but to tell the gender of a hyena cub, you need to very closely examine their curious genital structure. Okay. Hey, little one. All right, while we try to unravel the puzzle of the sex of Ribbon's cubs, let's go back across uh, to Sydney, who's talking about secrets of a different kind. And the discussion about what is happening by the surrounding of the dam cam, it is still on. And now I am going to show you one of these big animals coming again in order to visit that uh, dam cam area. You can see we have got... We have got something very much interesting for you to see. I know you don't want to miss this. Uh, don't get disappointed. We are going to Kalamba. Oh, that brutal Kalamba. We finally did find her, but she just crossed the road and she's disappearing into one of the thickest blocks we have in the area. It is just our luck. I am not even going to attempt to go through there, but it was a very special moment. Craig actually spotted her as we are driving along. She was lying right next to the road for that few seconds and we're like, stop, reverse, and she got up and just walked straight across. Oh, so we know for sure she is definitely here. <laughs> that was a guarantee. Well, let me just try go a few meters in, but she seems to be heading down towards, ow, towards one of the main dam, the Voyatella Dam, closer to camp. So she might appear on dam cam later. <laughs> So no, that's a no-go from me. I cannot get through there with this vehicle. So while we could do another loop around and hopefully spot her again, let's go back over to Sydney. Welcome back and uh, I'm very happy because uh, Kalamba has been spotted heading towards the direction of the dam cam. So the chances of seeing Kalamba by the dam cam, they are very much high at the moment. Let's carry on from previous now with the hippopotamus as one of the regular visitors by this dam cam during the dry season. You can see now the hippopotamus is starting by drinking by that pan. So it means the hippopotamus maybe is coming from a very long distance. And let's just see what is going to happen there. The log in front is going to show you something because it has been said on several occasions that these animals, unfortunately, the hippopotamus as well as the elephants, they cannot jump. So you can see how this hippo is going down in that water. Imagine this hippopotamus carrying this big Big body weight and try to jump that log that won't be possible so i just want to demonstrate to you how difficult it is in order to sometimes carry the body from the ground in order to jump let me show you something here i am going to use uh, this line here as the border if you can go and stand like this and hold your your toes and try to jump this line 
it is not going to be easy and you won't make it. Let me try. You can see there is no way you can be able to jump here without uh, holding uh, your toes. So imagine the hippopotamus carrying that very big body weight and try to jump in that water hole just to cross over that log. It is a very big exercise. And now hippo maybe is after a lot of grazing. So you can see now the hippopotamus is resting by that pen at the moment, which is helping him in order to lower the body temperature. This has got nothing to do with sunburn. Why? Because all this is happening during the night. You mustn't forget, we are talking about the things that are happening, the untold activities and stories that are happening by the dam cam. So it is normal for the hippopotamus to spend time in the water hole, even if there is no sun. At night, the hippo is showing us. Isn't this amazing? So if it is during the day, you look at the body of this hippopotamus, you will see some kind of reddish uh, fluid painting the side of the bodies. When those reddish things are painting the side of the bodies, you must know that those are just some of the subcutaneous glands which are there in order to serve as a sun, uh, to prevent sunburn. But now, hippopotamus by the Masai Mara, sometimes they get troubled by the predators. So let's go back to the Masai Mara and see what Steve is having at the moment. <laughs> I'm just trying to imagine Sydney pretending to jump like a hippo. <laughs> is it even possible for an animal like a hippo to jump? I know I went to a reserve in Malawi and they had black rhino in an enclosure but the enclosure basically was a very large area with just a very short little wire just about halfway to your knee um, and that kept the black rhino in because they couldn't get over that just a little electric wire everything else could jump over it and come in and out I suppose the hippos couldn't but um, the black rhino couldn't either so very interesting large mammals jumping off the ground well, updates from this side is not much has happened. The jackals are not the, the jackals are in the distance. I can't see them anymore. But the hyena clan is just sort of circling and circling and circling, and not really coming any closer. There's actually a jackal just off here, James. You see, just behind these lines, there's a jackal just off on the right there, and hyenas on the lugger at the back. So they basically walk around the entire periphery of where we are. I know it's a bit far, you're not going to get a good view, but there you can see hyena in the background. And uh, they're just sniffing and sniffing and sniffing and trying to figure out exactly what the strength is of this sort of lion coalition or pride that's going on here. And they'd probably be able to scent a lot of that from the urine smell. Because you know, hyenas have got the most incredible sense of smell, and nobody knows that better than Jamie Patterson. They have an incredible sense of smell, and I, I stand by this solidly. They also stink a lot of the time as well. Last night, they were right around the vehicle, and I promise you, it was outrageously pungent. Where we were, where Craig and I were sitting, it was an offense upon the olfactory sense. It really was. So Riven's Cubs are approaching June once again. They really want to make friends with her, which, oh, look. Oh, that's brave. That is so brave. I'm pretty convinced that one is a female, I'm almost certain. And the other, I think, is a male, but I haven't had as good a look. And then it is actually, oh, cute. <laughs> Love me. Love me. Please don't bite me. Please don't bite me. Oh, getting into the danger zone there. June, be nice. Yeah. Whoa, you asked for that. She's trying to suckle her cubs and you're being a pain. The begging of June's cubs obviously got through to the point that they are now allowed to suckle. The good news, of course, for everyone is that they have moved further on to Juma, which is fantastic for us because it means that they're going to stick around. Oh, well, speaking of dam cams and all sorts of surprises, let's go across to Rusty, who has one for you.
little bit. Well, we have Talamba very shortly crossing the road and she disappeared into the block. But then, guess who appeared next? We have Tandi, her mother. And they're not far from each other. And she's actually quite close to one of the pans, closer to camp. And isn't this a sight for sore eyes? She is gorgeous, absolutely pretty leopard. Now, whether or not she has cubs, we do not know. Where her den site is, we're still not 100% sure. We can have a rough area, a guess a rough area where it might be, if or if not, if she has or has not got cubs. That is our gossip for the time being on whether or not she had cubs or not. But it's been absolutely phenomenal. The or the last like <laughs> 10 minutes with the leopards coming in just after darkness and what's been happening at the dam cam the last over the last period of this week it's been incredible it's like the big brother of juma that dam cam it gives us a few surprises um, i'm sure talamba will show up on screen very shortly down at the dam cam but thank you very much for joining us this evening. It's been absolutely great to have you all here. Thank you very much for your questions and hope to hear from you tomorrow.